Okay, good morning everybody. Thanks for coming. My name is Ian Owen. I use the name Ian Rory Owen when I write books. Um, what we're going to be doing today, if I give you a sort of general overview first, um, what I'd like to do is give you a recap of the book, which is um, the first slide. And there's some quite intricate argument in the book. I'm not going to give you the intricate argument today. What I would like to do, given this is an opportunity for me to get on the soapbox, is what I would like, really like to do, I think that when we're together, the thing to do is really talk about practice. And so, if I give you an overview of where we're going to be going this morning, um, I want to go, I'm going to call it back to basics. Uh, I'm not a conservative, but I like the phrase. And given that this morning is going to be about clinical work and actual practice, and, um, what I want to do is to kind of re-establish what I think the basics are, and I'm going to make some links. So the links are going to be to do with the Bowlby Ainsworth model of attachment, going into contemporary research, um, in particular by Una McCluskey from York University, and then to connect up with what I think has possibly been the most uh, interesting uh, piece of research in recent years, which is Crawford et al. in the British Journal of um, Psychiatry, volume 208, which was um, a study on individual therapy, and the main finding was that psychotherapy helps 95% of all people. It doesn't help one uh, or twentieth. The other five percent are actually not helped. And the links, just to give you the the, 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 the bare bones of it, I want to make links between Freud, uh, Bowlby, McCluskey type research, and then Robert Lands. You may not have heard of. I don't know if you have. And then end up talking about home and work and how those two things fit together with attachment in mind. So that's the place I want to get to at the end point. So if I also then talk about the overview of the, the day and what we're going to be doing. So we've got three stages. Firstly, me talking only for an hour. Then we have a coffee break. Then a seminar. So I've got some cases for you to consider. And I think the best use of our time is to break up into small groups and then I will circulate with you and then the last hour is going to be just kind of group discussion so there's loads of time for interaction and talking at the end so if you have any questions um, please ask during the lecture part but also there's going to be loads of time for discussion at the end. Um, Susan, please. can I just ask a question? Yes. I didn't quite hear the thing about 80, the, the summary of that 80% no. of benefit. Okay. <coughs> yes, 95% of people benefit from psychotherapy and 5% don't deteriorate, they actually deteriorate. Which I think is a really powerful thing to bear in mind. Okay, so effectively I've just given you the, uh, the learning objectives of the day and what I want to do in a minute is make some basic recap. If some of you are experts, I, I, I have no idea what your uh, background is and what your level of understanding of attachment is already, and I think possibly one way to go with this is to um, um, maybe have a show of hands. So possibly, um, let's, let's talk about how long, firstly, how long have people been practicing? So could you put your hand up for um, all of the mental health work you've been doing, in, in any capacity whatsoever, who has been practicing more than 10 years? Lovely. Keep your hands up if you've been practicing more than 20 years in any capacity. I don't know. No? Anybody practicing more than 30 years? Yep. Anybody practicing more than 40 years? Okay, great. Thank you. So we're a mixed, mixed ability. And I think some people <laughs> haven't, haven't put their hands up. 
<laughs> so I don't know what your background is, but clearly by coming here, you, you are obviously showing your interest in attachment. So um, also, you can see there, it's got the word formulation. And what I want to also to give out are what I think are some key differences and um, talking about also what I would call a developmental formulation, which means accrual of history, and then maintenance formulation, how come the problem stays the same? Uh, maybe you're familiar with these ideas already. Okay, and then the end point is the um, management of home and life. Okay, I hope you can see that all right. <coughs> Um, so what we've got here... No, I can't see the ones on the left. No, what is... Okay, I'll just point at it then, if I may. So what you've got here, this is a very, very general diagram. So you've got a starting point, and you've got an end point, and the loop bit on the top is the control. So um, who, who has ever taken the lid off the system on your, on your toilet? Has anybody ever done that? Yes, <laughs> yes, okay. Who knows how... A central heating system works. How yeah, okay. do you mean? Okay, I, I will. I will. I will answer that point. So, when you set your central heating for eighteen degrees, the temp the heating comes on up to eighteen degrees. When it hits eighteen degrees, it goes off. It, then, when it drops down again, it comes back on again. So that's the end point. So control theory is something that Bowlby did make connections with. And if you don't understand that there's movement towards the end point, a set end point, um, that is the point he was trying to make. So what, what the idea of control theory within attachment is, there are different end, end point settings, and the person moves in different ways to maintain the end point. And the other key idea is negative feedback. So there's a discrepancy at the start, and negative feedback means the discrepancy decreases until the end point is achieved. It's the opposite of positive feedback, where you've got a discrepancy, the discrepancy increases, and it gets worse and worse. Okay, so that's the general, the first very so general... I'm a little bit confused, what yes. are we actually talking about? Are we talking about ways in which the self becomes uh -huh. limited, are we talking about yes, affect Yes, we're going to get there. In the, what is it we're Yes, actually? we're going to get there in a minute. So yes, I'll just give you the first, it's a very general yes. idea. Thank you. And mm -hmm. to pick up on your point, um, to have a secure <coughs> base is um, to turn towards the other person. And so with I think the way to look at attachment theory is effectively there are four different types of settings and between the self and the other there are four very different um, starting points and end points that are maintained. So with, if you just focus in on secure base first, so the starting point is for a child or an adult there is either distress or there's a problem. They, f they turn towards the other person, in the case of children, to the parent who they can depend on, and the distress is calmed, and that's the end point in the secure base. So, um, let's. Is everybody familiar with the terms? Um, SSP and AAI, are everybody familiar with that? Strange situation. No, no, there's some nodding and some shaking. Well, I'll just recap that. So, for um, the standard way of uh, investigating children is a set procedure called the strange situation, which has eight parts. There's um, the parent, usually the mother, um, an experimenter, and there's then two separations. So with, when there's a secure, secure process, a small child plays with the toys, looks around the room, and there is exploration going on. If there is distress when the mother goes out of the room, it can be calmed. Um, when the mother comes back, there, there may be a little bit of distress, but the, the, the key point is that the, the, 
the distress is calmed. This does not happen in the anxious process. So, when there's the first separation, or even before the separation, a small child would be kind of wary and looking around the room. On the first separation, uh, when the mother comes back, strangely, the child could be inconsolable. And also, there's then no further exploration and playing with the toys, even after the first separation. After the second separation, it could be even worse. So, it, it's really unusual. And it's very unusual when you compare it to the next one, where there is a different ending. So, on the first separation, possibly, when the mother comes back, the child doesn't even look up. How strange is that? Second separation, maybe that happens again. It's like, or mother picks up the child, child struggles to get away, oh no, moves away from the mother, what is going on? And number four is um, a situation where a child maybe kind of goes towards, towards the mother and then stops halfway and looks kind of shocked. And it's called disorganised. So some of, the re some of the research finds that there may not have been abuse. So it doesn't mean there has been abuse or violence, but often this, um, when this is happening it actually co-occurs with the other three swords and it's disorganized because the other the other types are have a clear structure where this one is is different okay so can I just check it out then so are, are people familiar with Freud? Have, 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 has everybody read Freud? So, ha, 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 is everybody um, in tune with psychodynamic thinking in, in, a, in a general sense? Yes, yes, please. Yes, good, good. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know what your backgrounds are, that's why I'm asking. Okay. So, I think the key item here is to really understand the power of resistance. Resistance is linked to, I think, shamefulness. So the problem, when there's a lot of resistance in your client, it feels awful to tell the truth. You're not going to even tell you the truth. And possibly how this plays out is they might want to kind of test you out. They'll tell you a little problem, see how you go with that. If you're any good, maybe they'll tell you a bigger problem. And that will build up. If they really do trust you, they might want to tell you about the sex life and something that really is bothering them or something they find intensely shameful. Uh, so you get rewarded that way. The other thing is <coughs> unconscious communication. I think, really, it's just two people empathising each other. Of course, the quality of the accuracy of the empathy can vary an awful lot. But, as a general measure, just allow yourself to get caught up in whatever's going on, and you will get the feelings. Particularly in the first few meetings, it'll be possibly more transparent what that person is bringing to you, and you can feel it. And that is very important information. Okay, now, have people heard of Robert Langs? Could you show your hands? Okay, there's some, okay, so I'm just gonna make a connection here. So Robert Langs is a New York psychoanalyst, and what he originally did during the 1970s was to research supervision and to look at craziness in the name of therapy. And what I mean by craziness is all kinds of really weird things that are show that the therapist is completely off mission. So, um, individual therapy in the therapist's house, in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. um, variable fees, um, things that are promised that are never delivered. Um, frightening people to stay in therapy, like you can't leave. If you leave, you'll get cancer. Really crazy, weird stuff. And it's a very strict model. And what he tried to do was to link falsificationism, which is Karl Popper, the idea of that. Um, and he linked it with Freud. So the idea is that 
what people are upset about is the implications of bad care, effectively, and crazy craziness. And to interpret somebody is to be aware that somehow maybe they're either they misunderstand you, or possibly somehow you're not. The quality of what you're giving isn't good enough, and they do pick it up. So, the link between Bowlby, Lang's Freud, I think, is around clarity, clarity of the roles, and collaboration between the two. So, from there, <coughs> there's lots Sorry, of. Can I ask please, please. Um, when you say Lang's, yes. I'm, I'm struggling to think, do you mean R.D. Lang? No, no, no. Not that's Ronnie, Ronnie Leng, the <coughs> Scot. I know who R.D. Leng is, but yes. I'm just about to see a connection no, no. with in the broad sense of the word, there is a, a certain phenomenological attention to, and that is possibly the, the commonality. This is Robert Langs, who is a very strict um, American. analyst, basically. Very, very strict. There are only four interventions with Langs. Um, silence, listening, interpreting, saving the frame. You can't ask questions. Not allowed. The last one staying in the frame. Saving, saving the frame. Saving the frame. Saving, saving the frame. Yeah. Making yeah. the sessions clear and mm -hmm. safe mm -hmm. is the key point. <coughs> okay. Now this is this is my back to basics. So what I've done here, what you see on this on the slide, is um, <coughs> a recap of all of Bowlby's comments on what he thought therapy should be. And number one, I call it the golden rule. So the idea is you really need to make a secure base. That person needs to turn to you and feel that you are genuinely trustworthy. And also part of the role is to check and make sure that's working, that they are actually doing that. Um, all the other stuff is... Um, a kind of repetition, but I feel it does really need to, need to be said. When I look at other attachment works, um, to, to my mind, they can be really interesting and overly clever, as it were, and I'm not getting what is the therapeutic impact of what they're saying, and I think that this is why it needs saying. It does need repeating, I think. So, all of these things are pretty damn obvious, perhaps, but they get lost along the way. And I think the consequences of uh, not doing the basics properly is that things will go wrong. And often the case is the person just doesn't come back. You've got no idea why they've dropped out. And to write to them or to ring them up would potentially, maybe you wouldn't get the right answers. You could possibly try with a questionnaire when they've dropped out. Why did they drop out? But really you're not gonna find out what's gone wrong. Something is something, there's been some either their expectations have somehow been dashed because maybe they were too high and you didn't find out what they were. Um, or something like that. There's been some omission or miscommunication oh, possibly right. of some sort. So all of these things well, here. Yeah, one of the most interesting things I learned at the last um, European conference on yes. psychotherapy research with adolescents yes. was that Actually, I mean, I, like you, assumed that when people dropped out, they were not happy. But as it turned out, that certainly in the case of adolescents, many of them felt they had quite enough, thank you very much, and, uh, and they didn't see the need to kind of come back to reassure not me okay. or you or the next person. So it, and, and in our own research study with young ad with adults, yeah. we saw some of that as well because we had a follow-up built into it. So it wasn't me chasing the person, it was uh, the anticipated, you know, researcher. Yes. And uh, so it, it's it's not a good idea to assume that if somebody's dropped out, that it's a failure. <coughs> yeah. Thank you. It would be reassuring though to know what's happened with it. It would indeed, yes. It's left with a big question mark, mm -hmm. what's going on here? Has there been a problem down here? Okay. So, shall I go through all these points or are they pretty obvious? I hope you can see them all, right? 
Um, I, will, I will make some very brief statements though. So it's perfectly fine to ask people, um, particularly if there's some kind of lead in, if they if they make comments about you and say, oh, your life, your life, they just assume your life is perfect. Here you are, psychotherapist, everything's fine. It must be fine with you. Um, it would be really kind of interesting to find out what what it is, how how they do see you, and to just kind of explore that if if there's a lead into it, or even if there isn't, if you've got the impression somehow that um, they have high expectations, or their expectations might be somehow unhelpful in some way, it's a good idea to you to to use that and just explore what 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 it is they do expect, and to make proper agreement about what the meetings are about and particularly what the priorities are. I'm going to go on a little bit further with that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> however you do work, one, one of the key points would be to make differences between what the parenting was or what the earlier problems have been and compare it to their current relationship with partner or children or best friend and to try and differentiate the two. Um, does everybody know the original meaning of the word interpret? Everybody okay with that? So I, 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 will, I will answer my own question. <laughs> yes. um, to interpret is to suggest a possible cause. So the classic would be, uh, a moment ago <coughs> you were talking about your childhood and I could see there was a tear in your eye um, and I noticed you didn't mention that. So I think that you feel really sad when you talk about your childhood. Is that right? And by doing that, you're inviting them to also to talk about what it is the cause is. You're suggesting a possible cause. You're not telling them that is the cause of what the problem is. Don't do that. Just invite them to, to, to discuss with you what is the cause. What, what is it they're feeling? They, they, it's clearly there was an emotion there, and they didn't comment on it themselves. Okay. Um, the separations, so if you are sick, if you are pregnant, if you, I don't know, for any other reason, you go on holiday, anything like that, it's necessary to kind of almost try and preempt what that may be like for the client. Do they feel, if you go on a three-week holiday, do they feel utterly abandoned for three weeks? What do they do? If you're a me meaningful person to them, it's been really helpful. <laughs> Possibly it's even worth discussing with them. I'm going to be going on a three-week holiday. Um, can we talk about it? Are you going to be all right? Um, the last item says psychoeducation. Bulby said psychoeducation is a good idea. So maybe if you have a little leaflet or you have some books that you could recommend, um, that's the way forwards. <coughs> okay, this is my first formulation. I do hope you can see that. Um, in case you can't see it, I'll just explain the idea first. So, in the name of clarity, what you, what would, what, what you could achieve, either possibly even in writing or, or through discussion, would be to just note what with the person, what is the quality of their relationship with them, mother, father, brothers, in the, what, what it was in the past, and then just to connect it up with, um, at that time, how did they feel then? Were, was it like they were in a family where just things were imposed upon them? That was that the mother or the father has the image of how this child is going to turn out, and that's the image I'm going to give to you, and you need to follow that. Was that, was, was that how it was? Or was it much more, oh, let's find out what, um, what Pauline likes. Oh, Pauline seems to be really good at cooking. Um, would you really, you know, do you want to be a, a cook or a chef? Or do you want to, how do you want to take that forward? It's different. So it's, it's the conditions of what's, what's going on in the family. The second bit here is a kind of version thereof where you're actually looking for, have there been um, a key incident, or a number of incidents possibly, where um, 
maybe there's been either trauma or something very significant has happened for that person. So it's just a way of keeping stock of what the what the inputs are. And frequently, when there has been trauma, it's interesting to find out how it was beforehand, how it was afterwards. What's the difference between the two? Are there any changes? So, in particular, when there's been early loss, death, divorce, people have moved away, and the other one is where people have moved a lot in lots of different schools, they've had to re-establish themselves over and over again. Um, people who have children where the parents have been in the army, as a classic case, may have been to sit in the schools. Or, the other one is where people have been in care, and they may have had 30 or more placements which have all broken down, that a child has had to re represent themselves to new people and be in a new family over and over again. Okay. So that's the developmental formulation. Um, <clears throat> I want to introduce a theme now, which is a theme about home and the importance of home and particularly to make connections with uh, adult life. Um, so I think the best way of the proper developmental way of looking at attachment would be to look at childhood but also how, the, how does that then develop for the adults and one of the key findings is that sometimes when a person, an adult, has had a secure childhood and the current relationship with the partner is insecure, either anxious or avoidant, actually the good early life does not act as a buffer, unfortunately. This is an empirical finding, uh, Tribu, Crowell and Waters. So when there has been uh, secure childhood to secure current relationship in adulthood, um, there is a secure base and what that means is that the people can, they, they do turn to each other when there's a problem, it is discussed. When there was security in childhood but insecurity in the current relationship, there was distress, uh, there was no, no buffering and they were quite likely to separate or divorce. And in that case, they were 34% likely to divorce in the, particularly the early years of marriage. Um, also, when the couple is under stress, different things can happen. And particularly in the secure to insecure um, relation, um, there was a lot of conflict, negative emotions about the relationship, and unfortunately, little secure base. Um, there were then other um, there are two sets of conditions, and when there were the other versions, so going from insecure to secure, um, people improved, but they were only, effectively only just secure in the current relationship. Um, there's another version which is insecure in childhood to insecure in adulthood, when there was no secure base, lots of conflict, and then the problem is effectively it's um, very uh, unlikely or, or, or great difficulty in negotiating the problem, making compromises with the partner, and actually problem solving. So that's a, uh, I think, a very pertinent um, research finding. And also, let's think about um, the way the way adult life is at the moment. So um, in America, I think. There's m more single households than there are um, couples. I don't know what the figure is for the UK. However, also with LGBT people, they may not have a partner, they may not have children. And in that case, is the, the friendships, the friendship network, and their personal identity is going to be, as it were, in the, or the secure base or it's going to ameliorate and bring up their mood and self-esteem so that when there are problems, there are other different ways of accessing help and um, getting more positivity into their lives. 
Okay, so this next bit is about the therapist's role altogether, and again, it's a restatement of the basics. So what I mean by guardian is that I think number one for the TH, the actual therapist's role is to, um, from, from the first meeting, to be aware of um, trying to create a sense of security, trying to answer questions, and trying to connect with the person and also to be relaxed and open and enjoy meeting with them at the same time and there's a whole load of other kind of admin things to be done and in the, moral, the, the current legal situation you would also need to be thinking about safeguarding is everybody familiar with the word safeguarding yes yes so there's a lot to be done and but i want to restate what um, are the common points uh, to make clinical work safe and enjoyable for yourselves as well as for the other person. So basically the client and the therapist both win and you enjoy your working life. Um, because if the basics are not done properly, um, people will... Um, there could be a whole series of negative consequences from that, which will also then decrease the, the lived experience of you enjoying your work, and also it will raise complaints. And I don't know if you're okay. Do we have many NHS people here today? Yes, yes, well, um, the uh, other thing are, are, uh, I think is a, a real major um, problem is what is the organisational context like and is that secure or is it indeed in any way helpful? I'm going to get on to that, my little hobby horse of this, for this week, by the way. <coughs> Charity settings are just the same. Are they? Mm -hmm. Well, the way I understand... Work within a, a lot of work within a charity context. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the good thing the last 30 years is there's been an excellent uptake, an increase in understanding of mental health needs <coughs> and uh, to a degree um, an increase in um, supply of help. However, um, I don't know about London, but in Leeds all of the NHS services are being cut and all of the other um, services in the town are completely at maximum and so it's extremely difficult to get any long-term help. And I don't know how it is for private practice, but that is the non-private practice situation. <coughs> okay, so lots to be done. I'd also put it to you that the secure base for therapists is having really good supervision. And if not, that you have really good <coughs> colleagues and clients you can turn to in the moment. And those of you who are in a clinic where there's people around, you have colleagues around, you could go and have a bit of a moan to a colleague if they've got five minutes and have a cup of tea with somebody. If you're feeling upset, disturbed by what you've heard. And the other things that can happen are sometimes when you dread somebody coming. Because you know it's going to be really hard work and you're going to be struggling. And the stuff they're going to be saying is deeply disturbing. Does anybody work with torture people? Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's, it's <coughs> really hard. For me, um, I don't like hearing about death of babies. It's really not good. Um, <coughs> however, in that situation wh where you have agreed to meet with a, a torture survivor or someone who has lost children, um, you, you're saying, I am, I am up to be with you, with your pain. That, that is, that you're making a commitment to, to somebody. And this is why assessment phase is so important. Um, I was sitting in a cafe earlier this morning while I was waiting to come here, and I thought to myself, a weird thought went through my mind, how do you spell assessment? T-H-O-R-O-U-G-H is how you spell assessment. <laughs> be really thorough. If, if there are questions you have, they're just going to float up in your mind when you, they've gone out of the door, <coughs> write them down. Okay. 
Okay. Um, when you see people and they tell you that they were sexually abused, and the next question is, ooh, where, where is the perpetrator now? Do they have access to children currently? Um, when they tell you, oh, I've got suicidal thoughts, the next question is, well, um, well, I would never, uh, I would hope that um, when you have suicidal thoughts, how, how, how do you cope with them? And the best way to go with that is to work out an individual crisis plan, which goes, when I feel suicidal, I will do this, that and the other. And you actually do it with them. So one way which is just a, a generalised sheet, or actually give this sheet out to everybody who's suicidal, when you go, no, you sit down with them, work it out with them, what are they going to do if they feel suicidal, properly, actively suicidal in the treatment with you, and that means you're, you're providing safe care for them, and you can also stave off a whole load of problems that could come. Um, the authentic item is, I would suggest to you that um, if I put it like this, when you have a busy morning, I don't know if you see people back to back, I see people back to back, I see three people in the morning. <coughs> it feels to me like a busy morning, it feels really achievable. I'm quite um, slightly buzzy if I've, if I've been really difficult, <coughs> complicated, unusual things happening. It feels slightly sort of up in my mood, but it's good. I know that things are going well, it feels, it feels good. This is how the work should feel to you. I would suggest to you. I mean, I do mean should. If it's going away from you're not enjoying the work and you're really worried about them and you dread seeing them, that, that that's really important information. Um, and also, it's the quality of attention that you give to be open to somebody, sit in front of them, and they're going to tell you all sorts of stuff. You catch, you capture all the try and capture all the nuances. You need to be open to that. And I would suggest that the only way to do that is you need to be really relaxed and calm and wanting to be with them in that moment. Okay, and the other stuff is all about clarity. So, um, explaining to people early on, particularly maybe even the first meeting, well, this is how we, this is what I would expect. If you're sick, please, please ring and tell me that you're sick and you can't come. I will do the same. Or if you have it on a piece of paper, Give them the piece of paper, they know what's going on then. Um, okay, oh, okay, the other point is if they have complaints or they don't understand it, the really good thing to do, I would suggest, <coughs> is you even preempt the idea that um, if there's something you don't understand or you don't like, please tell me, I will explain it to you. So it's being open, uh, transparent. Okay. Now well then, um, we come back to Freud. So, all of these items here are about resistance, and um, I think this needs restating, frankly. If people, for any reason, aren't um, really up to present themselves, not willing to present themselves, it means they're not quite open. Um, there's something being held back in some way, or they give the impression that there's somehow there's some sort of unspoken either criticism or misunderstanding. If they wanted help so much, why are they 20 minutes late? What's, what's going on? Was it really the bus that was somehow wrong, or was that really the case? What, what, is, what is going on? Um, another one would be. Oh, uh, they come in the first time. Oh, I really want to tell you about what happened in, when I was in prison. Oh, okay, then, fine, okay. Um, so you have 15 sessions, they've not talked about what happened in prison. Um, you, you, if you've got an agreed end point, oh, uh, number 19, oh, I, I'm going to talk about what happened in prison today. Well, hmm. Um, so if they really did want to talk about prison right at session one, well, and they're not quite ready for it, and 
uh, earlier on, you need to be saying to, the, to them, okay, when, 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 when would you like to talk about prison? Are you okay with that? Um, so you're opening it up. Um, if there have been lots of therapies where the therapist was always somehow useless, and it, didn't, it wasn't good, they were no good, they didn't feel helped, that's really interesting. What happened there? And what clearly where you're going to go with that one is, well, I want this to work for you. Let's find out what happened last time, or the last times, um, so it doesn't happen again. And explicitly say that to them. All of those items of Freud's idea of resistance, all of those top ones, apart from the bottom one, which is a different one, where if you're to when you, as I'm sure you are, um, intuitive, empathic, you can pick up on something, you can almost do the work for them. You make all the connections. You're working really hard. You're saying everything. No, don't do that. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Maybe you find yourself doing it in one session because they somehow, it's easy. It's the easier way to go for you to do all the work. Yeah. It's easy that way. Don't do that. It's okay to model it, but after a while, they need to be saying, or oh, well, they ask you the question, oh, I don't know why that happened. What do you think? And they say, oh, that's interesting. What? Um, so don't just go along when it's been put back to you all the time. Don't go along with that. Okay. <coughs> just before I change that, so um, empathizing <coughs> is really key. And when you look at the person's face <coughs> and non-verbal demeanour, you pick up a whole load and the other one is voice tone. So if they suddenly raise the voice, does that, does that mean they're angry at that point? If they look really, really sad, they're trying to hold themselves, hold themselves in really quiet, maybe that's an indicator of what, what's genuinely happening for them. So what they're telling you doesn't connect with the emotion that they express really important. <clears throat> okay, so um, this is another formulation and I get this from reading in between the lines of what Bobby was saying. So and um, this is this is a positive one and the next one is a negative. So um, what do we think is really the case in secure uh, process is what's really good about it is the there is discussion previously so that the person has a good and accurate understanding of himself and has a positive picture of human nature so the belief is I'm, I'm a decent person I am worthy of being cared for is the sort of initial starting position and generally speaking most people out in the world are pretty, pretty good actually and if I ask somebody to help me, they're very highly likely to help me. And that's what I mean by belief. The belief is a positive one. And generally speaking, I was, what I've just said about positivity, I would say that's true. And I don't think I have rose-tinted glasses. I think that's quite a realistic position. So, when insecurity, what you've got there, is proven beliefs, a good mood, and then the reflection on the self, the value of the, of the self, is also proven. I am a decent person. And those three things fit together. And if you take that and you compare it to suicide, then you've got a really interesting comparison. I will make, a, I will make a, some comments on, on the suicidal case. The suicidal case is, I am a disgusting, bad person. Um, death is a really good idea. If I do kill myself, I won't feel the distress anymore. Uh, very bad mood. The self-worth, absolutely zero. So when I make that very dramatic comparison, it becomes, I think, more obvious what the differences are. There's an amazing quality of silence in the room. <laughs> okay, so... Um, going back to um, the other things I was saying earlier in the morning, 